Hello, good day and welcome. My name is Richard Byron Cox. I am the UNCCD's Head of Capacity Development and Innovations Office. And welcome to our first global panel discussion. Today, World Environmental Day, the 5th of June. This panel discussion is for you, you, and especially you. Because we are the United Nations, we are here to serve you. We are your organization. And today on World Environment Day, we discuss a very important question, the question of poverty, how is that related to climate change, and how economics all influence that. I'm honored, it is my great pleasure to be able to welcome all of you here today. Now, the UNCCD is one of the sustainable development conventions. As you know, there's the Climate Change Convention, there's the Biodiversity Convention, and there's the UNCCD. We believe that these are questions that concern the entire world. And so the world need to be involved in discussing these questions. And so we have given you this platform today so that you can raise your voice and see what you think, how the questions of poverty, climate change, and economics all are interrelated and how we can solve these problems for the future of all mankind. It is my honor to tell you that for the next two hours, you would be listening to a very esteemed panel of people who know about these questions and who have been involved with these questions for many, many years. They're not just intellectuals, but they are practitioners, people who have tremendous experience in dealing with these issues. So my job is simply to welcome you, you, and especially you, your part of the world, this is the global discussion. And now it is my honor, my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, beautiful lady. Um, she is a trained journalist. She is the press secretary of the UNCCD and one of the foremost reporters on environmental issues in the world today, Wagaki. So without further ado, we get the program started. Thank you very much. See you. Hello. And welcome from wherever you're watching around the world. My name is Wagaki Vishnevsky, and I will be your host this afternoon, afternoon here in Bonn. I'm delighted to moderate what I'm sure will be a very stimulating and inspiring exchange of ideas around this very provocative question. Is poverty necessary in the world to mitigate climate change? That question has many faces to it, so it depends on what your take is. We have a very distinguished panel to help us navigate through the conceptual and practical dimensions of this question. And at the very start, I would like to mention that this is one of two panels organized by the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification in observance of not just World Environment Day today, but the Desertification and Drought Day on 17th of June. On that day, if you've enjoyed this uh, panel today, you might want to join us uh, where we will have a new group of people and I'll announce at the end who those will be. Let me invite our distinguished panelists to join us. They've been waiting and watching us. And to start with, I have Mr. Ibrahim Tiao, who is the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of our convention. He will be taking this spot after me, and so you will see him when he comes up. Next, we have Professor Olivier Duchuta. He's the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty. Welcome, Professor. Next, we have Mr. Aziz Ahmed Diallo, a member of parliament for Burkina Faso and the mayor of Dori. He's still joining us. We will, he will come up when he's doing his presentation. Third, we have Professor Yanis Vera. Varoufakis, who is a member of parliament uh, in Greece. He's an economist, politician, and philosopher. Welcome, Professor. And last but not least, we have Professor Yan Le, who is head of the research program Growth and Development, Development at the German Institute of Global and Area Studies. Let's get started. Let me invite the Executive Secretary of the UNCCD and my boss, Mr. Ibrahim Tiao. You have the floor, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen from around the world. I'm very pleased to be with you here today. 
and uh, I'm grateful to all panel members who have given their time. And I'm grateful to all of you uh, who are watching from around the world. I hope you will enjoy the session. My role here is not to give you a lecture, but rather to introduce the subject on behalf of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, and then give the floor to the many specialists we have from around the world to, um, to uh, give you more insights. Poverty, climate change, economics, land, what is the link between all of this? And what world are we living in today? First, let me start with the second question. We are in a world that is going through a different pandemic. Many specialists has, have said that it is a zoonotic disease, meaning that it, come, it came from animals. It came from, according to some scientists, bats transiting to pang pangolins and then transmitted to humans. And you have now human to human transmission. Why do we have viruses that are normally living in bats or in pangolins? Why did we go to get these viruses? We have been trading bats. We have been eating pangolins. We have transported them from around the world. That is what we call the globalization or global trade. We have been buying and selling everything. We have been eating everything. We are, yes, we are probably one of the species that is the most voracious species in the world. Now, why do we have to buy a virus that comes to basically create havoc in this world? Why do we, have we gotten to the situation where we are at the moment? Is that wealth? Is that normal? Is that a good business? Or is it poverty? So let's come back to the second uh, topics, poverty, climate change, and economics. Let us define what is meant by poverty, first of all, because the definition today is rather based on economics, is rather based on a yardstick that is basically the wealth you know, measured in dollars. Whether we can eat dollars or whether we eat what is produced by nature and how much is a person, a poor person poor? What is the definition of poverty in a context where you have everything that you need provided by nature and you can find all your needs, all your daily needs, including food and, uh, and, and shelter from nature? Or are you richer when you have a lot of dollars, but you have nothing offered by nature and you have to buy everything and you have to import everything from, from abroad? So we let us have a definition that reflects basically the nature, the, the ecosystems and the wealth that is provided to us by nature. What I'm say, trying to say is that there is a serious need today that we redefine our relations with nature. We have always exploited nature. We have never managed it. We have even over exploited nature. We have we never managed it. And we come to a situation where our appetite, our unsatiable appetite for natural resources, for exploitation, for mining, for uh, all sorts of uses uh, of natural resources have led us to the situation where we are today. Let's take a pause, let's make a pause, take a step back and rethink. I hope the three months or four months that we have been locked down have helped the world rethink our relationship with nature. It shows how much we are dependent on nature and on nature, how much the relationships between we as humans, the wildlife, the food, the air, the, the, the water, the land are all interrelated. So therefore, let us rethink how we can prevent pandemics like the ones we are going through today happen again. Is richness, is wealth really accumulating dollars or is wealth having a good health? We are in a world where a lot of rich people went hiding for a small virus that we cannot even see. What is wealth in that context? Why are they not flying anymore? Why are, why are they not going to the nice places that they know they have been going to uh, anymore? 
why would they do they have to stay and lock themselves in rooms literally for two months three months to save their lives what is wealth what is health and to what extent the zoonotic diseases 75 of the new infectious diseases are zoonotic according to the world health organization we as unccd think that part of that or a large proportion of that uh, uh, of that situation is happening because of the change of land use that we have introduced in the world today we have gone too far into nature we have gone to forest reserves we have seen ebola we have seen sars we have seen mers mers we have seen zika we have seen a number of infectious diseases that are due to viruses that live on animals but do not exist in our bodies therefore we do not have immunity for them and these viruses have been transmitted to us now and we are we find ourselves in a situation that we cannot control anymore so we need to rethink about nature and our relationships as human beings with nature we call it whether we call it a social contract, a new social contract for nature. We need to do that. We cannot continue to exploit resources. We need to manage them. We need to feel like we are part of that nature and we are not super, super you know, powerful. Yes, we can go to, to the moon. Yes, we can dream even going to Mars, but we are still living on earth and we can be affected by small particles like viruses. So we need to respect nature. Nature has given us a lot of warnings in, rec in, the rec in recent years. Whether you call it cyclones or hurricanes, these are violent, the violent events that have occurred over the last few years. They can be silent. It can be a drought. It can be a desertification. It can be air pollution, but they kill, and they kill as much as the violent events have. Uh, so these are all warnings that we have received but we do not seem to understand that nature is giving us some advice that we should be careful about how we interact with it. Now we have COVID-19 and the world came to a standstill. So it is important that we redefine our relations with nature. We recognize that there's a limit to how much we can go to the deep ocean, how much we can go to forests to clear, to clear it, how much land we should be using because we can feed ourselves with the amount of land we have already exploited. We can feed ourselves. We can have the leisure that we need in, by, in respecting nature. We can have the, the well-being that is required, that we all aspire to in the world while respecting nature. So I would like to provoke the panelists and to provoke all, you, all of you in saying, what is poverty? What is wealth? And where is nature in all of this? So I leave you with these words, thanking you for your time and thanking you for being so uh, uh, participating so um, uh, in, a, in a such an effective manner to this panel. We are here to listen to you. We are here to facilitate the dialogue and we hope you will benefit from it. Thank you. So there you go. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thiao, um, for challenging us to think about what our relationship with nature is like, what poverty really means, and that um, redefining uh, poverty has to include the idea of nature and our interaction with nature. And therefore the question um, whether uh, poverty is really necessary in the world to mitigate climate change. You've had the deep questions he's asked us. You will hear other deeper questions coming. So without further ado, let me now uh, invite our next speaker, Professor Olivier Duchuta, who will speak to this question. What are the social, political, and economic aspects that define poverty? You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Wagaki, for this introduction. And of course, my uh, sincere gratitude to Ibrahim Tiao and Richard Baron Cox for their introductions. Um, what I would like to do in a few, in a few minutes is to speak about uh, what we are witnessing today and how this relates to inequality in a world of scarce resources. What we're witnessing today is really the most significant economic downturn we have seen since the Great Recession of 1929. We had before the crisis some seven, 750 
million people living in extreme poverty in the world. And as a result of the um, economic downturn we are now facing, resulting from the pandemic, um, at least 60 million more people will be falling into extreme poverty, which means uh, that many years of progress in reducing poverty in the world um, shall be lost as a result. That, of course, is the result of the fact that, globally speaking, about 4% of the world's GDP will be lost uh, as a result of the crisis. The loss will be 8 9% in the OECD countries. It will be larger even in some countries, such as South Africa, for example, where it's estimated to be um, 10%, and in countries which are heavily dependent on, on tourism, um, on remittances, it shall be um, especially important also. And it's important to realize that this crisis, this economic crisis we are now facing, will particularly affect developing countries because they are now facing um, five shocks together. First of all, of course, a shock of production because the supply that they are capable of producing will be um, lowered as a result of the pandemics, uh, since many economies have been closed down for um, many weeks. Secondly, uh, these are countries that are going to suffer from the loss of remittances from foreign workers. Um, that can be very significant for some countries and uh, the, the remittances will, will fall by at least 20%, representing um, a significant amount of money, perhaps as much as 100 billion US dollars in reduced revenues for these countries. Thirdly, these countries have witnessed a significant capital flight from their economies. And that means that their local currencies have lost value in comparison to the, to the hard currencies in which their foreign debt is labeled. And so for this reason, the debt service for these countries shall increase significantly um, because the debt is in, in dollars, in, in euros, in yens, and that um, uh, it will be therefore even more expensive to reimburse. And um, fourthly, these countries have witnessed um, um, important losses in recent years because of the lower price of um, raw commodities. And uh, that is in particular the case for, for oil, but also for other raw commodities on global markets. So these countries are especially impacted by the crisis and we shall see a significant setback in um, the, the progress of human development. In fact, one recent document published by the UNDP just a couple of days ago estimated that um, the, um, the Human Development Index, which is, as you know, a combination of a measure related to education, a measure related to health and life expectancy, and a measure related to income, this Human Development Index would lose six years, we would go back six years in the progress on the Human Development Index measures um, as a result of the crisis, the closure of schools, the, the number of casualties resulting from COVID-19 and um, other um, uh, diseases that could not be treated because of the healthcare services being overwhelmed. And of course, as a result of the significant loss of revenue for many workers across the world, uh, particularly in the informal sector and those who are self-employed. So this is a situation we're seeing. And it's important to, to realize that one major risk in the current situation is that countries return to um, the normal reaction they have in the face of such a crisis, which is to relaunch economic growth without thinking about the environmental impacts in the name of saving companies, in the name of rescuing um, the economy, uh, they may forget that we have also um, a climate crisis, um, a crisis in the state of uh, uh, soil health across the world. Uh, soil degradation is, of course, one major threat to, um, to humanity because it feeds into climate change and it, it is the result of the loss of biodiversity and, of course, um, the erosion of biodiversity. These are concerns that uh, were with us before the crisis. There are still concerns that should guide our responses to the crisis. And I would say that this crisis, as um, painful as it is for population, as 
as hard as it strikes uh, people in poverty, it is at the same time a unique opportunity to um, choose for a much more sustainable pathway towards recovery. Globally speaking, about 8 trillion uh, US dollars, um, 8,000 billion US dollars, um, are being re-injected in the economy, um, in particular in the form of state aid going to companies that otherwise might fail, and uh, to a lesser extent in the form of uh, social support to low-income families and to workers who lose their source of revenue. So this is a, a massive investment uh, by states in the, in the economy. And of course, the quantity of money that states can inject in the economy shall depend on, on the financial capacity of each state. And for example, it is estimated that in, in rich countries, um, the stimulus effort shall amount to about 4.9% of the GDP, when it will be only 1 or 1.5 percent in developing countries. But um, nevertheless, globally speaking, the injection of public money in the economy will be very significant. And I believe this is um, a great opportunity to redirect the economy and redirect production and consumption modes in uh, a direction that is compatible with the sustainable development goals. And so the question is, which kind of model for um, development should we choose in this regard? And I would say that the key challenge for us today is to reduce inequalities because of the very strong links between um, inequality and non-sustainable modes of growth. Um, this is for a number of reasons. And, and, and first of all, because um, globally speaking, it is the, the richest uh, segments of the population that are the most important um, um, emitters of greenhouse gases and have the greatest responsibility in environmental destruction. In fact, one study has concluded that the 10% richest people in the world are responsible for 45% of total greenhouse gas emissions, whereas the 50% um, uh, most poor people, the 50% um, bottom of, the, of humanity, is responsible only for 13% of greenhouse gas emissions. And that is a study by Lucas Chancel and Thomas Piketty from 2015. So in other terms, the richer you are, the more you consume, the more you have an, an important ecological footprint. And as a result um, um, of inequalities, many people in the world aspire to espousing the lifestyle of the richest people, and that is simply not sustainable. So combating it is a major um, tool to reduce um, the ecological footprint globally. Secondly, if we have less inequality, we need less economic growth with all the ecological impacts associated in order to reduce poverty, because any wealth creation shall benefit those at the bottom, shall benefit people in poverty if you have strongly equal society. So in that sense, mechanically speaking, the more equal a society is, the less there shall be a tension between creating wealth in order to stimulate development and um, uh, reducing the ecological footprint. Um, thirdly, um, in strongly unequal society, there is a competition between the luxury desires of the rich and essential needs of the poor. And if the rich can pay for the use of resources to satisfy their desires, the poor people will be outpriced and the production system, the resources will not be serving the essential needs of the poor. And this is very true if we look at this globally speaking. There are huge amounts of land, for example, in Latin America that are used to produce maize and soybean to feed animals in industrial production processes in the global north. And there are large amounts of land in the global south that serve, for example, for, for bioenergy crops in order to satisfy uh, the desires in um, wealthy countries uh, for ethanol or biodiesel. So there's a, there's a major tension between um, the, the rich and the poor uh, who do not have equal voting rights on the marketplace, which is really a plutocracy in which 
the more dollars you can spend, the, the more you can direct um, how the resources shall be, shall be used. Fourthly, the more um, unequal a society is, the less people will be encouraged to participate in political and civic life, and the less they will be encouraged to have a pro-environmental and pro-social behavior. There are many studies showing that in more equal societies, it's easier to change consumption styles, lifestyles, uh, for greater sustainability. So for all these reasons, I believe that in the economic recovery plans that are now developed all over the world, we really need to put the fight against poverty and the fight against inequality at the heart of our efforts, because that is the only way to ensure that environmental concerns shall be um, a priority concern in, in the way these plans are designed. And let me give just in closing two examples of how we can manage this ecological transition with um, the social transition that we need. The first example is carbon pricing in the form either of um, um, emissions uh, trading systems in which uh, uh, economic actors um, um, enter into a market on which they exchange um, permits to pollute, if you wish, or in the form of a carbon tax. Now, everyone agrees amongst economists and um, uh, specialists of climate change that carbon pricing is vital in order to encourage the right um, investment and in, in order to um, encourage the right consumption styles. Um, however, it is striking that only 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions are actually subjected to carbon pricing, about 11 gigatons of um, carbon dioxide uh, equivalent. And only 5% of total emissions are priced at an adequate level. So we need to drive investment and consumption choices by introducing carbon pricing globally. Um, however, we must do so by avoiding at the same time uh, socially regressive impacts. And as um, has already been mentioned by Professor Jeanne Lay in, um, in, in various uh, settings, um, it, there are examples of, of places where this has been achieved. In Sweden, for example, that has the highest carbon tax prices in the world, a carbon tax was introduced already in 1991. Um, the, the revenue from this carbon tax has served to lower taxes on, on corporations and on labor. In other terms, the, the, the bad companies have been taxed more and the better companies have been taxed less. And this has served to make it politically acceptable to introduce a very high price on carbon. In the provinces of Alberta and British Columbia in Canada, Similarly, the revenue from carbon pricing has served to support tax rebates for low-income families, showing how um, ecological efforts could be combined with socially progressive schemes. In the field of energy, we have also a huge opportunity, the increase in the use of renewables in the energy mix and improved energy efficiency measures can go hand in hand with poverty alleviation and the reduction of inequalities for a number of reasons. First, because if we phase out the subsidies going to fossil energies, we can finance tax reforms that are progressive and we can finance social protection. If we invest in renewable energies, we create employment. Renewable energies are far more labor intensive than fossil energies, and we can train workers in order to have access to these new jobs that will be created in the renewable energy sector. And finally, programs such as those that insulate buildings in order to improve energy efficiency can allow to reduce the energy bills of poor households. And so that's another example or another sector where immense gains can be achieved and in which we can at the same time reduce poverty, reduce inequalities and um, succeed in achieving this ecological transition. So I'd like to close here and I'd like to, to thank, of course, the, uh, the UN Convention uh, to combat desertification secretariat for organizing this um, uh, this webinar i really look forward to the exchanges with my colleagues thank you thank you uh, thank you professor deshuta for that very interesting presentation as you heard from him i think my big takeaway is that the more equal societies are 
the easier it will be for us to address climate change. And the second thing is we have to find very innovative ways that will discourage people from consuming more, that will discourage the inequality that continues in society through, for instance, taxation and finding energy pricing. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be um, Mr. Diallo, Aziz Ahmed Diallo, um, whose topic is climate, what really is climate change experiences in tackling the problem? Mr. Aziz Ahmed Diallo, you're welcome to this uh, panel. And we're actually meeting in the conference room called Hama Arba Diallo, named uh, after your father, who was our first executive secretary. So uh, it's my pleasure to give the floor to you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to, first of all, uh, apologize for being late. I've had some technical difficulties and also extend my thanks and appreciation to UNCCD for conveying me uh, to this very important uh, webinar. Uh, I also present my respects to all the other panelists and all the other attendees. Um, uh, I speak from uh, Ouagadougou, but I'm the mayor of Dohi, which is the capital of the Sahel region in Burkina Faso. Uh, geographically, we are located not far from the Niger border and the Mali border, so we can say that uh, we are in the heart of the Sahel region in the desert uh, in Burkina Faso. And, but mostly the challenges that we face, I will speak about Dori and the Sahel region of Burkina Faso, but I'm pretty sure both sides of the border in Mali or in Niger, they can relate to what I will be saying. I'm sure yeah, there are a lot of specialists uh, amongst the, the attendees and the participants, and uh, I don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, but uh, as a mayor, there are a lot of things I can share with you in terms of how climate change is playing out uh, in our region. Because uh, I've been a mayor for four years now, and uh, we notice, we see, uh, we are worried about what we are seeing. Uh, it's a region that where over 80% of the population depends on uh, on, uh, on pastoralism uh, and agricultural activities. And uh, that area is now, that is normally supposed to be a big contributor to the GDP of our country. Uh, the impact is, 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 is uh, Coming, is becoming smaller and smaller, uh, not because there are less producers or less farmers, but because they have no more access to, uh, to the land that they normally have access to that is capable to produce. If you look at, for instance, uh, pastoralism, we've seen a decrease, a very worrying decrease in terms of land that is suitable for pastoralism. Uh, areas where normally uh, pastor, pastors would move with their animals and have access to green land and produce and farm and uh, sell. All these areas now have greatly reduced. So now you even have also an increase in terms of uh, conflicts between farmers and, uh, and, and pastoralists. Uh, that land, the small land that is now available is now uh, in the interest of everybody. Uh, obviously, you cannot expect the pastoralist to just keep his animals in an area where uh, there is no water, there is no crops, so there is absolutely nothing to feed them. Uh, obviously, they will move towards areas where uh, there are greener pastures, that's human nature. But those areas also with green pastures are becoming not only the the regular ones are becoming smaller and smaller because of the advent, because of desertification, but uh, the access now to the, the the main resource which is water is becoming more and more difficult. Uh, a few years ago, we could uh, we could uh, dig a well and then. Uh, by 70 meters, 60, 70 meters, we have access to the water tables. 
you can have a, a world that is su sufficient at least for consumption water con consumption but that is not the case anymore in the Dori region in the Sahel region uh, if you don't dig as deep as 100 and 120 meters you will not have access to the water levels you can have you can obviously see that the water tables have uh, dropped considerably which makes access to water even more and more difficult uh, and that's I'm, I'm speaking for instance now just for domestic consumption i'm not even speaking of water for production the level the areas also where we used to stock uh, rain waters for production for pastoral for, for pastoral production as well as for agricultural production those water these water places are also drying out much faster we have less rains uh, there are a lot of there's a huge reduction in terms of the quantities of rain that uh, that 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 we receive uh, every year. The period has shortened, the quantities of rain have, uh, have shortened, and, uh, and uh, uh, so it's, it's becoming, it's, becoming uh, it's, it's, it's very worrisome. It's very worrisome. Now you have people that are obliged to move with their animals, and they move to, uh, with the animals to locations where uh, they don't originally come from. So that creates a lot of uh, social conflicts, a lot of social tension. So what we've been doing for the past few years is those water points, we've been digging them deeper to increase the capacity to withhold ra uh, rainwater. So in some places we manage by digging uh, about 5,000 cubic meters, we managed to be able to hold sustain hold the water for two or three months longer than the usual period so that creates some stability at that level we also have a lot of other places where women are into uh, uh, agricultural production uh, not uh, not not uh, rice or maize or anything but at least the small agricultural production that they usually make to be able like tomatoes and uh, carrots and salad to be able to sell at markets and sustain the livelihoods uh, we've also had to dig some of those what we call bully marché we've had to dig them also deeper to increase the capacity to sustain uh, to withhold rainwater for a longer period for agricultural production the government is doing what it can with uh, partners in terms of uh, fighting desertification, increasing green points so that uh, we uh, maintain at least uh, we maintain the, uh, the the water tables so that they don't drop much higher, much lower than that. But it is a fact now that by the time you get to the months of March, April, May, June, before the rains come. Uh, access to water is a very very critical issue and it's creating a lot of social tension it's creating tension in an area where we are also already faced with the problem of insecurity because of all these issues of uh, terrorism and there's a direct link with it in a sense that all these young people that normally grow, uh, normally farm or normally uh, uh, feed their animals and sell the animals they're seeing the values of these animals dropping they're seeing that activity becoming more and more difficult so these youth that are being unemployed from one day to another these youth we are worried about them because 85 percent of the population in the region here is below 35 years old these people uh, if they cannot have access to their regular to their traditional activities are becoming vulnerable to terrorist organizations uh, that are tempting them with some small cash, some small income, uh, some small valuables. Uh, and we have cases where a lot of them have joined those terrorist organizations because they just have no more uh, alternative. So it, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that is very worrisome. Uh, it's playing out in different fronts. The government is doing what it can. Uh, partners are doing what they can. Local governments are also doing what they can. 
but it's it's it's, uh, it's very difficult. For instance, the municipality of Dori, we've seen a drop in terms of uh, our capacity to mobilize our own resources because a lot of economic activities have slowed down because of the security situation. So we have less and less money that we can we can uh, mobilize ourselves from our own resources to invest in these water productions so it's like a it's like a vicious circle uh, you're unable to uh, to to, uh, to invest because these are investments that require substantial resources it's not just a matter of bringing 10 or 15 people with shovels to dig and increase no that's that doesn't have any impact you need to bring in machineries that are not available here so companies that will have to come from the capital or from other regions and now they also take advantage uh, from a business standpoint with the security situation. They will tell you what, what you normally do with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 4 million CFA francs. Now they are going to increase because they are saying that, well, they are having difficulties in mobilizing personnel to go in those areas because of security reasons, so on and so forth. So uh, for, for, uh, for the Sahel region, we have 26 municipalities. I can speak for all of them in telling you that the situation is very, very, very difficult. And because of all the linkages now, these issues of development, issues of climate change, issues of security, uh, we are very worried. Unless there's really some very heavy investments that are done, uh, the production places, the production areas are known. It is important that we go to those production places and make sure that the resources are available throughout the year. Once we do that, we'll be able to stabilize the producers, we'll be able to stabilize the youth, we'll be able to keep them employed with uh, economic uh, opportunities, and that is also going to help uh, in terms of uh, security. But short of that, uh, everything is going left and right. Uh, municipalities are fighting, as I explained earlier, not enough resources to be able to do some substantial investments. And uh, we don't know when it's going to stop. Now we're into the rainy season. Normally by now, uh, a few years ago, I'm, pretty, I'm very young, but people that are older than me, I'm sure that are following or have more experience than me in these issues, would tell you that normally by now, we would have had some very good rains. But the city of Dori, the capital of Sahel region, we have, since the beginning of the rainy season, we haven't had one big, one uh, considerable rain in that, in that whole area. You have one so minute. Sorry, you have one minute. Thank you. Yes. So the situation is, is there. The linkages between the issues of development, issues of security, issues of climate change are very obvious. So uh, unless some more considerable effort is done, we cannot expect to have uh, an improvement in the security in the security sector, and we cannot also expect to be really be able to fight climate change and fight desertification in a way that is needed, in a way that is required. I thank you very much, and I remain here in case there's uh, any question I can answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Diallo. That was very very good, and you know when you think where we started with. Uh, Mr. Tiao talking about COVID-19 and the challenge that we are facing and the fact that we have a relationship with nature that we have to address um, in the context of poverty. I think it becomes very clear what you're talking about because you bring a very practical example of where people are at, what people are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And if that's the situation they're in, it's very difficult to contemplate or understand how people can actually not go into the wild how people can actually not begin to look for wild animals as part of, our, of, of their consumption. So it's a very, very uh, challenging situation. I also want to tie it into exactly what uh, Professor Dishuta said. He said that um, I think it was 10% of um, the wealthiest people produce 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions, and the 10% of the poorest people, the global population, produce 13% of the greenhouse gases. The 10%, I think that Professor Dishuta was talking about, are people like those who are from Burkina Faso. As far as I know, Burkina Faso is listed as one of, among the poorest countries in the world. So I can understand, um, uh, uh, Excellency, that you have a very difficult time 
um, beginning to even explain to the communities how to address climate change, beginning to address to the communities about how not to get into the world, how to deal with the social contract for nature and what that means in their context. So I think this takes us very, you know, step by step, we see how this is tying up. And so I thank you very much for your presentation. Please don't go away. There is a question for you. We will come back. Our next panelist is Dr. Yanis Varoufakis. Uh, he was asked to answer these questions. Do the pre prevailing economic relations contribute to poverty and climate change? You have the floor, Professor. Well, thank you very much. It, it's a great honor and a privilege to be in your midst. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, in, the next, in the last few months, the Grim Reaper, uh, through COVID-19's uh, intervention, almost claimed some members of, you know, the upper echelons of British society, for instance, you know, the British Prime Minister um, nearly succumbed. Thank goodness he survived. The Prince of Wales was infected, we heard. Even one of Hollywood's uh, um, most likable stars, Tom Hanks, got it. But it was the poorer and the browner that the Grim Reaper actually did claim. They were easy pickings, at least in the West, in places like Britain, the, Europe the European Union, the United States, Mexico, Brazil, India. And it's not hard to understand why. Disempowerment breeds poverty. And poverty ages people faster and ultimately prepares them for the cull. Those who used to think in the spirit of Thomas Malthus that only poverty can save the planet have already been proved very badly wrong. That which drives poverty is the same thing, the same force that drives climate change. Unfettered, oligopolistic, extractive, financialized multinational capital. In the same way, the extracted value from disempowered workers, the extracted profits from the earth, leaving behind what? Hordes of disempowered people, people who were, you know, before COVID 19 hit us, one or two paychecks away from destitution, from total abject poverty. Not to mention what the other thing that they left behind, which is scorched earth, dead coral reefs, acidic, acidified oceans replete with plastic. So if we know one thing, it is that Thomas Malthus was wrong. Poverty does not help the planet survive. Poverty and environmental disaster go hand in hand. But unfortunately, there is another type of delusion that needs to be exposed. A more recent one, one that we've experienced during the lockdown, the lockdown in the last couple of months. It is the delusion of over-optimistic progressives, especially in the West. Uh, good people, many of them friends of mine, who hope that um, the spirit of solidarity of community that we experienced during lockdown, that spirit coupled with um, the the empowerment, the real legitimization of the state, the fact that now the state suddenly seems powerful again, that governments seem to have power to do stuff. There is this feeling that, well, you know, now that we know governments can do things for us, and we have, during lockdown, developed these uh, bonds of solidarity and community, well, maybe this is the time uh, that the system, the political system, is going to help the poor and help the environment. That, so we're talking about this feeling of hope that um, now that state power is possible again and it is visible, with central banks, for instance, conjuring up from thin air trillions of dollars of yen, of euros, of pounds, and so on, that this rediscovered power will automatically be harnessed to look, uh, to look after the weak to give substance to you know, some like a Green New Deal for the world, to invest in good quality jobs, in green jobs, in green technologies, in public goods. And what greater public good could there be than the health of people, the health of the planet? The successful reversal of global warming, of plastic pollution, of all those things that make the planet uninhabitable for future generations.
it would be great, wouldn't it, if COVID-19 simply spurred into action governments, central banks, the powerful, to look after the weak, to eliminate poverty, and to reverse climate change. It would be. But it won't happen. It will not happen automatically. It won't happen until there is a global movement forcing the powers that be to do it. Because those with the greatest political and economic power will do their utmost to ensure it does not happen. In the shadow of falling prices, wages, negative interest rates, I sincerely believe that it's not likely that automatically the spirit of solidarity, which soothed our souls during lockdowns, will automatically translate into the use of state power uh, for good, to strengthen the weak and vulnerable, and vulnerable, and indeed to clean up the environment. If we cast our minds back to 2008, the uh, North Atlantic, if not global financial crisis, back then when Wall Street imploded, I think that period and what followed is a good guide. To cut a long story short, what we had was the refloating by the central banks of the richest countries of the mega banks. Mega banks were refloated. The mega banks used that money effectively to send a lot of freshly minted um, currency to mega firms. What did the mega firms do with that money? Because this socialism in inverted commas only applied to the bankers and to the very, very rich. This state produced cash did not extend beyond the limits of the oligarchy. The members of the oligarchy, the ultra rich, the mega firms could see, they, they, they understood and they were right that the masses out there, whether they were Greeks or Brits or Americans, or wherever they were, yeah, they wouldn't have the money to, um, to buy their products. So what they did was they used this remarkable quantity of liquidity produced by states and central banks to do what? Not to invest in good quality jobs and, 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 and green products, fearing that they wouldn't be able to sell them. So they did something much simpler. They used that cash to buy back their own shares in the share markets, to play in the stock exchanges, in the money markets, to buy you know, shares of their own companies, yachts, mansions. So we had remarkable asset price inflation, while the world at large, a large part of it, was condemned to deflation. Thus, why before coronavirus hit, we had up to $18 trillion worth of debt in negative interest rate territory. That, the moment you start talking about negative, negative interest rates, you realize that there's something distinctly wrong with capitalism when people are being paid to borrow. Uh, so, you know, as a result of this freshly printed money by central banks and governments that was pumped into the stock exchange, stock exchange, stock prices, stock markets flourished while we had the most toxic disconnect between the amount of money in the world economy, which has never been greater in volume, liquidity, savings, doesn't matter how you define it, and the level of investment in th things that humanity needs, like green products, green transition, green, green energy, the things that create good quality jobs. So this disconnect of the amount of money that was available and the low, much lower levels of investment in the real things was the reason why the last 10 years have been years of a stagnant capitalism globally that spurred on inequality. Why was inequality turbocharged over the last 10, 12 years? Because you had socialism for the very few, the bankers initially, the mega firms after that, and unfettered, um, you know, austerity and market competition for everybody else. So let's go to two months ago when COVID-19 arrived. What it did was not only did it 
cause a collapse, a simultaneous symmetric hit, both of supply and demand, which it did, that that would have been bad enough. But what it did was it operated like a pin that pricked this gigantic bubble. And it caused the disconnect between the financial world and the real world, in which billions struggle, it caused that gap to widen. And as this gap widens, something else grows with it. It is discontent. It is the discontent that gave rise to various political monsters who preach hatred, xenophobia, racism, and ultranationalism all over the globe. I don't need to give you examples, you know them. And now today, it is not just a question, will people get out on the streets and start buying stuff again? Will factories start um, being supplied once more uh, through supply chains? And these are, of course, big questions. But there is a deeper question and threat to global capitalism, at least the global capitalism we have now. I already explained how the you know, socialism for the very few, the refloating of the financial sector caused asset prices, asset prices to rise considerably, stupendously. And for liquidity, the liquidity that caused those asset prices to go up to be a major driver of this. But now we have a feedback effect. We have the opposite direction of causality. If you look at companies in the European Union, companies in the United States, but in other parts of the world as well, you'll find that many of them are effective zombies. The only reason why they are surviving is because they're getting almost free money to refloat and to, re to roll over their existing debts. So the very low interest rates keep them alive. So this liquidity is necessary to keep a large chunk of global capitalism going. But that depends on the asset prices being high because those assets are used for, as collateral for the liquidity. So the high asset prices that keep, keep inequality oversized and is the other side of poverty. The same coin has two sides. Yeah? High asset prices, huge poverty. That situation, which is unsustainable, is a prerequisite for the liquidity which sustains a large part of the corporate sector, especially in the North Atlantic. That is capitalism's great contradiction today. And that contradiction is threatened by COVID-19 because of the wholesale collapse of demand and supply. In the midst of, of all that, we are facing a serious threat. Over the last few years, in Germany, in Sweden, in Africa, um, in Asia, young climate activists. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but you have one minute. Okay. Thank you. I'm finishing. In the last year or two years, young climate activists managed to put on the agenda the importance of the green transition, of fighting against climate, uh, climate change. But now, today, governments are buckling under towering mountains of debt and are very much fear that plans for the green transition are simply not going to be financed. So what do we need in order to extract hope from the current predicament? What do we need to do so as to make sure that the fight against poverty and against, against climate change is not impeded by this wholesale crisis of globalized capitalism? We need a global plan, an international Green New Deal, but we also need something else. And in the international progressive movement that is going to plan the collective political actions that will make it possible to enact that international Green New Deal. Thank you, Professor. That was very eloquent. That was very clear. And I'm not an economist, but I was able to actually follow your presentation, which tied back into what uh, Professor Dishuta was talking about the way we are subsidizing the wealthiest people in the world and dispossessing um, those who are the poorest that uh, Mr. Diallo was talking about. And you also talked about the need after COVID-19 to do exactly what I think Mr. Uh, Tiao was talking about, having a new social contract with nature, 
but also, um, as, you, as you said, we need a movement. We need people that are actually engaged and active to drive this agenda. So thank you. And now it is my pleasure to, in, to introduce Professor John Yan Lei, I think that's how you pronounce it, who will yeah. speak on the issue, green growth and poverty reduction, pretty much taking it over, I think, from where uh, Professor uh, Varoufakis ended. You have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm sharing my screen. I hope you can see it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear listeners worldwide, uh, esteemed uh, other panelists, uh, thank you very much for uh, this invitation um, to this interesting and I'd say diverse uh, panel. Um, I'd like to add um, to this debate by providing some empirical insights from uh, low and middle income countries into the trade-offs and synergies uh, between economic development and poverty reduction on the one hand and climate change mitigation on the other. Um, wait. I, no, sorry for that. Um, on the Green Growth uh, Knowledge Platform, um, green growth is uh, defined as a pursuit of economic development in an environmentally uh, sustainable manner. So green growth, in a sense, is a counterpart to concepts that call into question, as we have heard, economic growth as a key element of economic development. A green growth implies, and that is central, that economic growth can be decoupled from uh, resource use and environmental um, pollution. In my talk, um, uh, I would like to address uh, three questions. Right? So can we observe uh, such a decoupling of economic growth uh, on the one hand, and resource use and emissions in low and middle income countries. Second, what is the relationship between green growth uh, and poverty reduction? And third, why are climate policies for green growth so difficult to implement? I have a first graph here, and I, in this uh, one I relate uh, per capita income and total greenhouse gas emissions per capita in terms of CO2 equivalents. Um, to um, uh, GDP, uh, uh, to GDP per capita. Here you will find seven selected middle-income countries, and for comparison, Germany, for the period 2000 to 2017. In this period, emissions per capita in Germany decreased from about uh, 11 tons to 10 tons CO2 per capita. And as you can see, there are quite a few middle-income countries that are now not from far from this level uh, of emissions, uh, despite a still considerable income gap measured here in 2010 US dollars. Um, in none of the middle income countries, uh, the average income exceeds 10,000 um, US dollars um, as compared to Germany's 50,000, so five times. So let's take a brief uh, look at uh, the main emitters from the developing world. So you can see here China, um, which has been the world's largest emitter uh, of greenhouse gases for several years, ahead of the US. And as you can easily see, there's a very close link uh, between emissions on the one hand and economic growth. Only since uh, 2015, around that date, have per capita emissions stagnated because energy efficiency in China is increasing. The second uh, largest developing country emitter is India. Um, India's per capita emissions today are still uh, way uh, below those of uh, Europe or China, but India's large population still makes it the fourth largest emitter, em emitter in the world after the, Euro the European Union. And although that curve there uh, that uh, does not look uh, as steep as China's, India's per capita emissions have risen, risen in the past 20 years by 50%. I have to skip more uh, cases for time reasons. Note that all, in all these countries here in the graph, with the exception of China, Thailand, and Germany, the population also grows by 25 to 30% cumulatively over these 15 years, in Ghana by more than 50%. And this should not be forgotten when we look at per capita figures. Strong population growth combined with rising per capita emissions results in a steadily increasing share of developing countries in global greenhouse gas emissions. We may be discussing later the uh, responsibilities for that. Let me turn to land. Um, in addition to increasing CO2 emissions from the production of energy, land use change also contributes significantly to rising greenhouse gas emissions, about 10 to 
five to ten percent of total emissions are accounted for by land use change. Um, and land use change, of course, is also um, a key driver of global biodiversity loss, in particular in the tropics. And uh, one important driver is the expansion of agricultural land uh, in the tropics, often at the expense of rainforests, as uh, you all know. With a website, Landmetrics.org, uh, we at GIGA, uh, but all with other international partners, are monitoring the development of large-scale land deals worldwide. And Africa, in particular, has become an important target region for such projects in the past 10 years. As you can see from the large number of projects on the continent in the uh, graph here in the upper right figure. A significant proportion of these uh, projects are, from an environmental perspective, fortunately, only slowly implemented. But nevertheless, land use change is taking place, and a lot of these projects are palm oil plantations, uh, the rise of which in the past uh, uh, 50 years, you can see in the uh, lower uh, left corner. This rise has had devastating um, implications. Here, here, here you can see the scope of conversion uh, for the uh, uh, Indonesian island of Sumatra, where vast parts of rainforest that have been fully intact in the early uh, 90s have fallen victim to oil palm plantation. And note, uh, for those uh, who know not, uh, don't know the geography so well, that Sumatra is one and a half uh, times the size of Germany. Of Germany. Um, but this is not the end of the story. My last uh, field trip uh, before uh, the travel bans uh, of today was to this island, to, west, uh, to Kalimantan, Borneo. Um, and what you can see here uh, in the upper uh, graph is oil palm plantations uh, today, basically. And what you can see below are the concessions for further plantations. No further comment. So uh, let me draw a first conclusion. These empirical examples and there could be many more, um, show that there are very few signs of decoupling economic growth from resource use and emissions in developing economies. Um, but let us now turn to the link between growth and poverty without losing sight of the environmental implication. Um, it sometimes seems and has just been suggested that economic growth is not only at the expense of the environment, but also fails to reduce poverty. Is that really the case? I'd say, in contrast to the previous speaker, this is generally not true. Quite to the contrary, economic growth, which on the one hand goes hand in hand with even higher greenhouse gas emissions, um, you can see the graph here from that I've showed you before on the left-hand side, um, on the other hand also reaches the world's poor, not always, but often. And uh, what I plot here on the right-hand side uh, are poverty uh, rates against uh, uh, income per capita, and again, you can see a clear link, right? You can see a clear link between the increase in average per capita incomes and poverty reduction. And there's not a single country among those selected here, which are important ones, in which growth has not been accompanied by a significant re poverty reduction. China from 30% to under two, in India from 40% to 20, in Indonesia from 40% to 8%. And also in Ghana, poverty has been half on 25% to 12%, always in the time horizon that I indicated before. Um, but let us move a bit beyond those averages and aggregates and uh, have a closer look at the welfare implications of land use change, the destructive power of which uh, I have highlighted before. As some of you may know, an important part of palm oil or rubber is in some countries, for example in Indonesia, produced by smallholders who typically uh, cultivate farms of three to five hectares. Research at the University of Göttingen shows that poverty rates among farmers in villages where these cash crops are grown um, is much lower than where this is not the case. And in palm oil growing villages, for example, uh, in the region that we study there, poverty rates are below 5%, compared to about 20% in villages where traditional crops, often rice, are being grown. So, what I want to suggest here is uh, not that uh, oil palm plantations are a good thing, but that we have a fundamental dilemma. We have a trade-off often between growth and poverty reduction on the one hand and climate change mitigation on the other. And uh, what I want to try to answer in the last five minutes of my talk is why this dilemma is not so easily solved and why are climate policies so difficult to implement. And one reason for that is that often these policies has, have ambiguous poverty and distributional effects. And I will go into two countries, Mexico and Ghana. 
And not only, as uh, Professor De Schutte already said, not only economists uh, think that increasing prices of fossil fuels is a key climate mitigation policy. In developing countries, reducing fossil fuel subsidies has often been thought of as being environmentally meaningful and on top also progressive, as rich people would benefit more from the subsidies as poor people. A closer look, however, reveals that the story may not be so simple. And let's look at Mexico, where between 2012 and 2018, the government massively reduced energy subsidies, leading to stark price increases for gasoline uh, and uh, and LPG, uh, prices almost doubled within six years. Right? See the right-hand graph here. And during the so-called gasolinazo, uh, prices increased by 20% within a week, triggering violent mass protests, as happened anywhere in other places in the world. And one reason for that, suggests our research, is that not only a rich elite uh, is hit by abolishing subsidies. Specifically, what we looked at are small enterprises. And while it is true that on average fossil fuel consumption among poorer entrepreneurs is lower than for richer ones, um, those that actually do consume fuel, right, think of a taxi driver or think of uh, the street kitchens, are hit very hard by such reforms with price increases cutting very sharply into the thin profits. And quite a number of poor households are thus adversely affected by this climate policy. Um, a similar story uh, can be told. To interrupt you, I think you have one minute, so if you could try and wrap it up, it's very interesting. But yes. Yes, yeah. I can uh, talk about the unintended consequences of fossil fuel subsidy removals in Ghana in uh, my uh, in, in the Q and A possibly, but let me wrap wrap up. Um, so in sum, uh, I don't think uh, that we see uh, decoupling. We see at best stagnation at a very high level of. Uh, environmental damages, except for a few rays of hope that we might also discuss later, uh, for example, first signs of a coal phase out. Um, what with regard to green growth and poverty? The rapid poverty reducing growth that we have often seen is usually not green, which implies that there's a trade-off between poverty reduction and environmental protection. Uh, we have also seen that climate policy finally has ambiguous effect, effects, which is why it may be so difficult um, to uh, implement. But coming back now to over, over, over our overarching question, so does this mean that poverty is indeed necessary to mitigate climate change? No, but it means that mitigation measures entail risks for the poor. They may mean lower growth and therefore less and slower poverty reduction, and they certainly mean higher uh, prices for modern energy. And this implies that climate change mitigation policies need to take into account those risks. For example, taxing fossil fuels consumption is good, but poor households should be compensated for potential losses. Banning imports of non-certified palm oil into Europe is good, but even better if it is accompanied with support for producing countries or affected smallholders. So in general, I'd say we shouldn't be talking too much about the win-wins, but face and address the trade-offs that I have highlighted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Lay, and uh, um, I thank you for also addressing the discussions that were presented before. Let me start by apologizing for having to interrupt you. Um, I realize that we have very little time left for the um, participants, so I wanted to be fair to you and I want to be fair to uh, the participants, but I apologize sin sincerely for having to do that. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I think you've made a very <clears throat> clear argument that um, growth uh, does not necessarily um, undermine poverty reduction. It helps. This is the, my understanding. But you also said that when it comes to addressing climate policies, we need to think about how we implement this because the risks, as I think uh, Mr. Diallo showed earlier, may actually translate much, much more severely for the poor. And so that we need to address these two issues. And now we open the floor to, as I said at the very beginning, I wanted us to have uh, questions of clarification presented. We've been monitoring the questions that have come through. And I have to say that actually we didn't get questions of clarification. We got questions that are substantive and that follow up with that discussion. So what I will do now is actually make use of that time to open the floor so that we can actually have an interaction um, with the speakers uh, and, and, and the participants, 
Um, and to begin with, I would want to um, ask for a presentation for the children. When we ask for questions from the, all the participants who are registering, one of the group that presented or that sent a question to the uh, uh, panelists are the children. So I will present this um, question and I would like you to respond after this. Hello, my name is Katarina Larinzo. I'm 13 years old and I'm from Brazil. The question is, with the knowledge that climate change disproportionately affects people in poverty, especially children, we believe that all countries in the world should include environmental education as a compulsory subject in schools. Now, how can the UN and the UNCCD help in providing access to education in this issue and promoting policies where the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions can create opportunities for those in poverty. Additionally, what can the UN and the UNCCD do to ensure that people who are not living in poverty are reducing their emissions? Thank you very much. So I think we have that first question from children. There are actually three questions in one. And the first question they talked about is the impact of uh, climate change um, on children and their poverty. And I would want to ask the panelists if any one of you wants to take the floor to respond, uh, please raise your hand and any one of the panelists can take the floor and respond to the question the children raised. Um, what is the impact of uh, climate change on children in terms of poverty in the future? Uh, I can... Yes, Mr. Diallo. Thank you very much. Uh, in the Sahel region in Burkina Faso, women have a very great responsibility in the in the education of children uh, it is commonly known in our region that if you're able to find uh, to help a woman earn a livelihood then uh, you you can be sure that that woman with whatever with what she's going to earn she's going to take care of her family so we've seen a lot of cases we it's very common that we see women taking care of the needs of the children let it be paying for school fees or even paying for medical care so those activities uh, that those women undertake and create and they from which they generate their livelihoods we can count it as money that goes back to the family and the number one persons there in this case are the children. Uh, it's it's very common in our region. We're not saying that the men do not take the money back home, but uh, women usually take more money back home, invest more in the families than than the men would do. And taking money home means, as I said, pay for help, pay for school fees, uh, pay for medical bills, or buy clothes for for children. So by helping those women earn their livelihood, especially in farming activities or pastoral activities, you are helping the families and the, and the children. And women are very, very, in our region, women are more into agricultural activities than, uh, than, than the men. That's one thing I can say about that. Thank you. Any other panelists who wants to answer that question? Yes, Mr. Yeah, I can also come in and maybe also relate to another question on the opportunities of uh, mitigation. And maybe talk a bit about um, solar home, home systems, about solar lamps, uh, which, which have been shown, uh, for example, to lead to more uh, light in the dark uh, for children to have uh, longer learning hours. So here we do have synergy between a mitigation measure using a renewable energy source for lighting um, and uh, children welfare. Um, although I'd like, uh, as, as far as we have these uh, opportunities, I'd like to uh, also point out that this cannot be a panacea, right? So uh, I think a point that I would like to make is that we need integrated solutions, right? So we need to think also about the constraints that people face, uh, the, the cash uh, constraints that they face to purchase, for example, a solar home system in, in many African countries uh, in particular, but also the limitations uh, in terms of these uh, systems as regards the uh, supply of energy for activities at larger scale. 
Thank you. Professor Dishuta, do you want to uh, discuss the intergenerational inequality? Are you there, Professor Dishuta? I am there. It oh, seems yes. my, my, my connection is not good enough for me to have the video, but nevertheless, uh, I am there. No, I, I, I would like to thank uh, the, the, the authors of the question about, about uh, intergenerational um, inequality. And, um, and I would like to simply note that uh, um, poverty is one um, obstacle to the adoption of mitigation policies that, uh, um, that, that may sometimes be impeded by the fact that people need to immediately uh, find source of income on the one hand. Um, and, uh, and environmental destruction may result from the fact that people have no other livelihood options than to exploit uh, the land they cultivate in a non-sustainable manner um, or to, um, um, for example, try to intensify uh, production rather than using uh, mixed uh, or, or uh, rotating crop systems. On the other hand, however, um, it's, um, it's important to realize that uh, when, um, um, when mitigation policies are directed uh, towards meeting the needs of the poor, um, they can be extremely um, important in creating new livelihood options. And for example, agroecology, which uh, with others we've been advocating for, which is low input agriculture that tries to um, um, use mixed cropping schemes and maintain soil health and so on, can reduce the costs of farming and thus allow um, uh, the incomes of small scale farmers in particular to grow. So I think we should stop seeing um, the, the, the mitigation policies and the fight against poverty as opposed to one another. Rather, we should try to design these mitigation policies in ways that can increase the incomes of poor households, creating new livelihood options and thus creating a future for the children. I would like to supplement that um, because you've touched a little bit on, on land and agroecology because the convention itself works on land and I think Professor Lay did talk a little bit about the land. Um, I think the question was also directed to UNCCD in terms of what we are doing uh, for the education of children and youth. And I have to say that um, the UNCCD doesn't deal with climate change as a partner with uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So we don't have um, education programs on climate change for children per se on that issue. And on education, we're just beginning to get into working with young people we have not yet developed materials, you know, like a, a large enough cu curriculum that we would say that uh, we've developed for children. We have some books, we have a few products, but we do not have a lot of material. So I'm glad that you asked that question. And it's one that I will also uh, sub uh, uh, transmit to our management so that they're aware that there's interest in that area. How we manage land uh, is, is critically important, I think, for the future. Now, let me just... Um, tell you how we're going to proceed in this next uh, session. We had asked, before, as people are registering to submit questions in advance for the panelists to respond to. We've received a lot of questions during this session, and I have to tell you, we've been very encouraged to see the discussion going on uh, in the chat um, part of the, of, of, the, of the webinar. And so what we did is we collected those questions and tried to see which ones really capture a lot of the questions that were raised. And so we have about six questions that we will tackle in the next few minutes. And I would want to ask first each one of the panelists a question that I thought was appropriate for them. I regret that uh, Professor Varoufakis had to leave, but you know I'll, I'll make sure that that question too is, is presented to uh, the panelists that uh, are still with us. So, Professor Dishuta, I have a question here for you that's very linked to your subject. Is poverty a destiny or not? In other words, is it fated or not? And what is the relationship between poverty and climate change and the relationship between poverty and social inequality? So we'll start with these philosophical, more philosophical questions, and then I'll come back to the more practical ones that we got. Let me know if you want me to repeat the question. No, that's fine. Thank you. I, I, my connection has apparently improved because now we can use the video. Um, so thank you. Is poverty a destiny and what's its relationship to inequality? I think it's really important to, re to realize that the 
um, standard measure of extreme poverty, which is uh, 1.90 US dollar per day in parity of purchasing power across the world, is a very, very, um, um, uh, I would say, um, non-refined um, or gross measure of, of poverty, and that it certainly does not reflect the reality that even in rich societies where people live with an income that is significantly lower than that of the average, these people feel excluded, they feel marginalized, even though their income may allow them to survive and indeed to have access to a basic set of consumer goods living uh, significantly above this extreme poverty line of 1.90 US dollar per day. And there has been a very interesting set of studies comparing, for example, the experience of poverty in countries such as Norway, the UK, the US on the one hand, and countries such as Uganda, uh, uh, India on the other hand, for example. And what's striking is that despite the fact that people in poverty in these different countries live in, in very different material conditions, they all express the same sense of powerlessness, of economic marginalization leading to political marginalization and of an inability to change their fate. And so I think um, poverty is not a destiny, but it requires to combat it effectively that we don't simply protect people from extreme forms of deprivation, but that we develop societies that are inclusive, that can recognize to each person one's place and that we value the experience of the poor so that no one feels excluded um, from, from society. And that means um, indeed combating inequality and increasingly poverty should be discussed not as extreme deprivation leading people to have to make sacrifices on access to essential items. It should be described in terms of excessive inequalities that lead to exclusion and to people not being able to catch up with the average of society. And what's also striking, and I close with this, is that when a particular household is poor, the children in turn, because of the context in which they shall be educated, because of the cultural norms that predominate, because of their internalization of their powerlessness, and because of the physical and mental development impacts of poverty, um, these children shall themselves be um, at high risk of poverty in their future adult lives. And in some uh, countries, to overcome um, poverty, there is a need for five, six generations to, to pass, and sometimes even 10 or 11 in, in the societies with the least um, uh, social mobility. So poverty is not a destiny. Um, poverty should be seen as unacceptable inequality between different uh, groups of the population, and we need to develop societies that are far more inclusive to combat it. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lay, we have a practical question that we were asked. How can we improve the coherence and coordination of the policy, institutional, financial, and practical linkages between climate responses and poverty reduction? Yeah, um, that's a big question, of course. Uh, but I, uh, I was implying, in a sense, by also my concluding slide that, uh, and, and I think uh, we can all agree on this, uh, that climate change uh, mitigation cannot be seen as a task uh, of an environmental ministry. I mean, that's, uh, that is shown by um, basically all of the interventions uh, that we have had. Right? So, and, um, and, um, and I think uh, one important point that has been uh, raised several times now uh, is that uh, one important task will be uh, to uh, to make sure to find those synergies, as uh, Professor De Schutter pointed out, uh, um, uh, which would also be relevant in, in very uh, poor and uh, conflict-ridden contexts, as in uh, Burkina Faso, between um, uh, mitigation measures on the one hand and reducing poverty, right? So this is very desirable. Although I'd also like to add, it sounds more skeptical, you can turn it around the argument, right? So I, I'm also claiming that you need to acknowledge uh, the trade-offs that we find. Right. So, and one example is the carbon pricing that also produces uh, losers. And uh, one specific example of where 
uh, it becomes very apparent that we need cross-cutting, uh, that climate change policies are cross-cutting uh, theme for different ministries. As I, I see a particular need in collaboration between finance and economy ministries uh, on the one hand and social protection ministries. Right, so there's a lot of scope for uh, compensating losers for through uh, transfer schemes that are increasingly available uh, in uh, developing economies. Um, if we want to uh, price carbon uh, in in a sense that we uh, don't produce uh, poor losers uh, of these policies. It's, I think it's really important what what um, both of you have talked about the fact that. Poverty is not a predominantly developing country issue, just as wealth and accumulation is not predominantly a developed country um, problem. It's, it's a global issue and there are segments in our society that are better off than others. And it's the inequalities in those societies, but also globally, that we think we need to address. So we have two levels at which we have to address these issues. And perhaps this concern leads to the next question that we received. And that has to do with the fact that a lot of the climate support, support to the developing countries is coming from developed to developing countries. I think we have had a lot more about the financial discussions and the challenges in, in, in providing those resources than perhaps any other thing. That's probably why there's a lot of um, opposition towards the implementation of climate change policies. Now, the question, Mr. Diallo, I will direct to you because you said your governments are doing something. But what are the ac actions that have been put in place by international organizations and developed countries that you can tell us about that ensure transparency in the utilization of these funds that are provided to mitigate climate change? Well, what I can say is, you know, we are in countries that have all uh, adopted decentralization as a form of uh, government. And environment is one of those issues that, that those issues that have been transferred uh, where on paper there is some transfer of uh, resources and capacity to local governments. Our central government also have decentralized offices, deconcentrated offices in the various regions. So on paper. Uh, they are supposed to work with the municipalities, with the reg regional governments to implement a whole variety of projects uh, in health, in education, uh, also in environment. But as I said, I insist on saying on paper, uh, if we follow these procedures properly uh, and the required resources are put at the responsibility of the local governments, then yes, things can work and local governments can have a very good uh, knowledge and very good oversight and ensure transparency of the utilization of those resources. But unfortunately, that is not the case. It is not the case because if you look at the amounts of money that are transferred annually from central governments to local governments, which varies from one country to another, uh, these resources are insufficient to be able to uh, carry out uh, uh, sustainable investments. So the small investments that are being carried out, if you, if you take out the money that is sent uh, to run these offices for oper the operational costs for these offices, there's not a lot of money left for investments. Uh, in Burkina, for instance, uh, of our national budget is 4% of our national budget that is transferred to, uh, to, local, uh, to local governments. Uh, we have a government that was anticipating to get to 15%, but that never happened. I mean, that 4% is uh, for all sectors, for meaning education, uh, health, agriculture, everything. It's 4% for, it's that is transferred. It's grossly insufficient. When it comes to, uh, to international organizations, a lot of them work with uh, international uh, agencies that, are, that have, some of them have offices in our region. Uh, I can speak of FAO, for instance, or uh, WFP and a lot of other international organizations. But they run their own country projects. They run their own country programs. 
sometimes yes they involve local authorities uh, we do but our participation in those ones are very minimal for instance they do not come to us to ask us what are your plans we all have development plans we all have our own uh, our development agenda we're not just running helter skelter but not uh, i've not seen many of them come to us and tell us listen let's sit down these are the resources that we're able to mobilize internationally and uh, what do you think are your priorities let's together work on drawing up an, an action plan those resources will never be sufficient but at least those are the monies that are coming if we're able to work closely with them in uh, investing in those priority areas i'm sure by now we would have had a, a much bigger impact in some cases you see them coming uh, the next thing you hear is they have this organization has rented a, a big office in your city uh, you see them bringing their very nice jeeps uh, they start running they recruit staff without involving anybody locally there and then one day because there's a program or there's a ceremony then they will write to you oh we have this program personally i've refused to attend to a lot of these programs because i'm like well listen I'm not just here to come and sit at ceremonies and legitimize whatever you do. If you're not going to involve me uh, uh, initially in, for us to sit together and see where this money goes, no matter where the money comes from. If the money is supposed to be invested in Dori, then it's for the people of Dori. And uh, I, I'm not a rebel. I'm an elected mayor. I have a responsibility. Let's sit together. But none of, none of them does that. I've been a mayor for four years. None of them came to us and tell us, listen, uh, well, we want to invest in climate change. We want to invest in environment. Let's together draw a plan and we can even help them to go and mobilize resources and we can even put some of our money. What we are doing, I can give you an example when it comes to access to water. What we have done over the past, over the, over the past four years, access to rural, ac the percentage of access, people access to, uh, to water in rural areas in Dori, has gone from 65 to 78 percent in four years, and more than 80 percent of these investments from our own money. So we are also putting our money there. But uh, yeah, if if monies come together and programs come together, then I'm sure by now we would have much more impact. But that's not really what is uh, happening. Not only from the local gov from the central government, but also from organized from international organizations. Uh, I'm, and it's sadly. Uh, it's, it's a sad point to make. Um, so I'll also ask the same question to uh, Professor Dishuta. Um, what are the, and, 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 and Professor Lay, if you can talk about what policies are probably set, have been put in place for the resources that are given under the climate and other um, uh, activities to uh, address, to mitigate climate change or adaptation to climate change? Well, if I may, thanks. Uh, Professor Lay, uh, for allowing me to speak first. Uh, I look forward to your intervention. I think it's it's really important that in these um, programs that we finance in the name of climate change mitigation and adaptation, we constantly keep in mind the question of social justice. Um, and this is because without political support uh, for these um, investments in the um, um, a greener future in a low carbon economy and a biodiverse economy, um, we shall not have sustainable programs in place and they shall be blocked, challenged, uh, because people fear uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the changes will be imposed on them uh, at the expense of uh, the reduction of inequalities and, and poverty. And so the most successful changes are changes that have been gradual when possible, but we are now facing an environmental urgency. So it's not easy to be as gradual as, for example, Sweden has been with its carbon tax introduced in 1991. But if we cannot do this gradually, at least let us try to do this by involving people in making the choices that shall, um, uh, that shall have an impact on their lives, so as to build legitimacy, so as to understand the obstacles they may face in adapting their lifestyles and in adapting to, to, a, to a new economy. And let us make sure that all groups of the population affected by certain changes, for example, the workers in the, in the fossil energy sector 
or um, households who face uh, higher electricity bills as a result of the introduction of carbon pricing, that they be compensated and that um, um, measures are adopted to ensure that uh, um, from, the, from the social point of view, from the point of view of the reduction of poverty, the measure ultimately benefits them. I think the two um, can go hand in hand. It's not that I'm naive or that I believe there are no political fights to be, to be fought, um, but I do think that uh, we, we need to combine both efforts together and that it's possible to do this. Thank you. And, uh, well, a lot has been said uh, on what could have been said on the question. I think I would like to first second that uh, argument uh, to put uh, uh, equality and uh, poverty reduction uh, um, or to, to think uh, a poverty reduction uh, and inequality together with, uh, with uh, climate change uh, mitigation. I, I said that before. That means to mainstream uh, climate change uh, policy and explicitly link it. I, I think that uh, is a very important point. Explicitly link it uh, to um, such uh, social objectives in order to uh, also uh, increase legitimacy for those uh, um, measures, as uh, correctly pointed out. I think that's really a key point, since it's not uh, natural to assume that all people would easily agree, so that it's now us, in particular in the developing world, who need to accept higher carbon prices, right? So, and then you can you need to buy that uh, support. I, I think that's a very important point, um, besides the, the that it's an objective in itself, right? So uh, to reduce inequalities and uh, decrease, uh, in, uh, decrease poverty. That's the first point. The second is, um, and here it, uh, um, it's a bit, in, in a sense, it's uh, disillusionary uh, what to hear what uh, from the ground uh, what's happening. But I think all of us who are aware uh, of uh, the international uh, aid system are not completely surprised by what you are telling us, uh, what you're from uh, Burkina Faso and uh, as a mayor. Um, but uh, I think this should be taken seriously, right? So uh, we, we are claiming. Uh, participatory approaches. We're claiming that we're taking on board uh, local governments, uh, that we're hearing the voices of those concerned, and apparently that's not happening. And this is very bad news. Right? It's not bad news. Uh, we uh, somehow uh, knew that, uh, but it also has a practical implication. I mean, it, it means that in particular mitigation plans need to tie into the plans that people have. Right? And, and they, 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 it may be a local development plan uh, in, in the case of uh, the municipality, but it also is a national plan right? that needs to be discussed and where um, I, I, see a not, I see a lot of need uh, in order to increase the legitimacy of mitigation efforts in much better coordinating national efforts and what is being uh, talked about and also measures designed at the international level. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, scope for more coherence there and, and in fact, uh, much more um, acceptance of uh, views from uh, people concerned in developing countries who may have very different views and very different objectives of what they want to achieve. Okay, so um, I think we're, we're kind of running out of time and I want to thank you for those responses. I would just want to come back to tie what we have discussed um, here today. I think one of the key takeaways for me is the importance of addressing social inequality. Um, that in addressing the more equal we are within countries and across countries, the better we will be, the easier it will be to address climate change. Second, is that COVID-19 has opened a door for two things to happen. We either continue with business as, new, as usual and it's going to be worse for the poor, or we begin to change and make those uh, transitions. Um, the third thing I would say is I think a lot has been talked about the different mechanisms that we need to put in place, that we need to be innovative, that some policies will not work in some countries that will work in others. The other thing I think I have had is a question of accountability, how we need to ensure that the people affected and the local governments and the implementers at the front line, at the front line who are interacting with communities are involved in these global processes because otherwise it's not going to address the needs, it's not going to respond to um, where we want to go. 
Now, I really want to thank you, and it, it was my honor and my great pleasure to facilitate and to moderate this discussion. It's been very, very interesting. You've made me think beyond what I would normally do. So thank you very much. And I know it's been a long two hours, but I think they've also gone very quickly. And so for that, I want to thank you. I also, as I said at the beginning, uh, this is one of two panel sessions. The second one will be on the 17th of June, and that will be a high level uh, ministerial one facilitated by the executive secretary. And I invite you to join us then. And now let me do the great honor of handing over the floor back to Mr. Richard Byron Cox, who with his own team are really the brains behind these events. So good. Um, I'm Richard Byron Cox. I'm here to wrap this up. And um, before I say um, our final goodbye from you, firstly, I want to first apologize to the panelists where we had to stop you for a while, in particular, Professor Yanis. Um, for that, the, the time was the problem here, and my, our sincere apologies. We know that um, you all wanted to offer much more to us, and we, I honestly, personally, wish that you could have done so. So again, our apologies for that. Secondly, I want to thank all of our panelists very, very much indeed. It has been very gracious of you to be with us and for the knowledge that you share. I personally have learned a lot, and in particular as regards how economics influence all of this. I, I do hope that this platform has allowed a lot of people to share their own voice on these issues and how we think they can be tackled, you know, and I'm really, really grateful and very impressed with what you all have done. So I really want to thank all of our panelists for having been part and parcel of this tremendous exercise, which um, was viewed around the world. I also would like to thank my team um, for this work. Uh, it was a lot of hard work. Um, I want to mention all of them, Alejandra, Jorge, um, Maria, uh, Sandrine, Nico, and Eldos. Um, these are all people from all around the world, from India, from, from Spain, from Colombia, from France, and so on. We are an international team. I myself, people have asked me that on the chat also, where I'm from. I happen to be from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which is a small archipelago in the Caribbean. So again, I want to thank um, my team for this hard work, but most of all, I want to thank you, the people of the world, for having welcoming us into your living rooms, um, on your screens, and for having participated in this. I do hope that we'll have another chance to talk to you again I, I wish you the very, very best. This panel is ours. We all have a role to play. Let us play the role. Thank you very much indeed. Hello, my name is Catarina Lorenzo. I'm 13 years old and I'm from Brazil. The environment is important to me because before we human beings existed, the environment was already here. But because of human activities, our environment is being damaged and many of us are seeing this happen and are not doing anything, probably thinking that we are not going to be affected. But I warn you, without the environment, our lives will be a tragedy. Being affected by our own actions and paying consequences of actions which could be compassionately avoided. Climate change and poverty are linked together. You cannot address climate change without addressing poverty, and you cannot address poverty without addressing climate change. Climate change has made poor people poorer and more vulnerable to its impacts. Poor people have already lost their lives and livelihoods because of climate change. When we talk about climate solutions, we need to think about social justice, where climate solutions, such as mitigation and adaptation, should include the protection of the poor and make sure that inequalities don't widen. Conocimiento, libertad y transformación. Desde el Amazonas nos unimos como embajadores para la ONU. Esto es Onitano Amazonas. Is poverty necessary in the world to mitigate climate change? I will join you for this very interesting panel discussion offered by the UNCCD CBM. See you. Hi, my name is Sutima Pandey. I'm 12 years old and I'm from India. I care about environment because our future depends on it. But our leaders are not taking it seriously. 
I want to protect the environment by demanding our child rights, like clean air, fresh water and healthy environment. Saving environment is very important to sustain on this planet, as we are not having a planet B. Thank you. La pérdida de biodiversidad está relacionada con el cambio climático y la pobreza. ¿Cómo cambiamos este panorama? Have you ever wondered how climate change affects our political and social issues? Do you want to learn more about the relation between poverty and climate change? If you do, join us this Friday on the webinar of UNCCT. درجات الحرارة تصل إلى 50 درجة مئوية في الشرق الأوسط. فما العلاقة بين الفقر والاقتصاد وتغير المناخ؟ تابعونا تاريخ 5 يونيو لتتعرفون أكثر عن الموضوع. Familia querida, buenas tardes. Mujer Semilla los invita este 5 de junio a un panel de discusión que se llevará a cabo por la UNCCD en donde se tocarán temas muy importantes como la pobreza, el cambio climático y el rol de los sistemas económicos en cuanto a estos dos grandes temas. La Pachamama nos necesita bien informados. Fundación Agresta is a civil society organization based in Argentina. For over 21 years, Fundación Agreste has worked towards sustainable development, especially in social and environmental issues, focusing on empowering rural communities, implementing innovative techniques for the improvement of family farming and artisanal products, among others. Fundación Agreste is an observing member of the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. In the last 10 years, it has presented many innovative proposals, in particular to involve the private sector for implementing UNCCD processes. Social and environmental commitment of private sector is especially oriented to recognize companies that incorporate sustainable land management among their priorities. It is widely understood that to implement sustainability projects, all stakeholders must be fully committed. In this way, Fundación Agreste seeks to work closely with public and private sectors and form a link between civil society, public organizations and private sectors. We believe this climate crisis is a result of a history of inequalities, but not only among Homo sapiens, it's been among all the species. At Compost Pack, we aim to change plastic consumption and industry habits. We are specialists on the development and trading of bioplastics 100% compostable for packaging. Many of our materials are extracted from renewable resources such as carbohydrate-rich plants. This is the future of plastic, and it implies a new usage of land that must be managed sustainably from the beginning. First, I'm a thing that I share publicly in my life story. First time I think that I share publicly my life story. Listen to the music of the morning, and Some of the girls, if it's their time for periodic, they would say, I can't go to school for the coming five days because I don't have anything to use. Maybe some learners at school, they will laugh at me and I'll be the joke of the day.
if you don't go to school, the only thought which comes into your mind, you say, so what can I do when I'm sitting here? Oh, I have to go and get married. And it will result in high birth rates because it will be an early marriages and most of the girls can suffer a lot because you're too young to be married. We were so embarrassed, there was so much absenteeism, so we saw it's necessary for us to make the pains. When you do something good for someone, it... Some of the girls, if it's their time for periodic, they would say, I can't go to school for the coming five days because I don't have anything to use. Maybe some learners at school, they will laugh at me and I'll be the joke of the day. If you don't go to school, the only thought which comes into your mind, you say, so what can I do when I'm sitting here? Oh, I have to go and get married. And it will result in high birth rates because it will be an early marriage and most of the girls can suffer a lot because you're too young to be married. We were so embarrassed, there was so much absenteeism, so we saw it's necessary for us to make the pain. When you do something good for someone, it